So let's take a look at how we can manage memory when we have a multiprogramming system here. So in a multiprogramming system, as we've seen, we have several processes in memory at once. And what we can do is that when we run out of memory, we can swap segments of one process out to background memory. And we can also swap in segments of a process to main memory again. So when does it make sense to swap out segments of a process? Now, for example, if a process has to wait for some time for IO, so the process is unable to continue to work. So uh, it's unable to use its memory to change its memory. So essentially we can move this process out to disk and let some other process continue and use the larger free amount of memory then. And when the waiting time for IO is finished, then segments of that process that was swapped out can be swapped in again. Now, swapping has a significant disadvantage, and this disadvantage is that there is a large amount of time required for doing this swapping, because, of course, it's also an I.O. operation, and this is especially critical for uh, traditional hard disks, where you have a rotating disk, because you have to wait for the disk to, uh, the data on the disk to arrive under your head, so you have to wait for your head to move to the right track on your disk. You have to wait for the sector uh, that your data is uh, contained uh, to arrive under the disk due to the rotation of the disk. So positioning of the read write head of a hard disk takes lots of time. If you have a modern SSD, that is not as problematic anymore. But nevertheless, in addition to latency, you have to transfer this data from background memory back to main memory. So that means you'd also have a significant transfer time that you have to consider when swapping processes. Now when we perform swapping, there's an additional problem. And this problem is that addresses in processes, if you don't take any special precautions, are usually statically linked. And this means your addresses are fixed. So if your program ran at address 1000, it would maybe access data at address 1100 and 1200. And these addresses 1100 and 200 are fixed. So if we move this program over to a different address, we would actually access the wrong data or jump to the wrong subroutines in our program when we use these fixed addresses. So that means that with our simple approach, we can only swap our process back into the exact same location in memory where it was linked to. And this would mean if we have uh, larger new segments in memory, that were allocated after that one process was swapped out. Swapping that in would create a collision because finally we had two uh, different processes that would try to occupy a same, uh, an identical set of memory locations. There is a possible solution for this which involves partitioning main memory. So this means we just split our main memory into different partitions and only allow one process per partition. And so we can swap a process into the same partition as it was before so it is at the same addresses but then we'd have conflicts for partitions eventually and our memory cannot be used optimally so uh, this approach is obviously not optimal so we want to try a better approach and this better approach is to do dynamic allocation and to try to relocate our program in memory so if you have watched the uh, lecture number eight on details in Unix systems of process creation, you've already seen some details on this. So how a linker works, for example, we'll give a quick overview here. And I'd like to refer you to the previous lecture, uh, which is obviously optional. So it's not relevant for the exam, the previous one, uh, for more details here. So the problem that we have to face is that all the machine instructions that are part of our program all of these use addresses. So for example, a jump instruction, which changes control flow into a function. So we call a function or we jump to a function. Uh, this usually has an absolute address as the target address. So if we move our binary program to a different address, well, we would jump somewhere else, obviously. And additionally, you can also have load instructions to read variables, for example, from global data segments like data and BSS. If this data was now swapped into a different address range, this 
load uh, instruction that wasn't changed would load data from uh, an incorrect location. Um, of course, there are ways to uh, get around this problem and uh, people have invo uh, invented different approaches. And these different approaches try to uh, yeah, change the addresses. So they try to link the address used as the operand of instructions for jump targets or for memory locations. So uh, one solution, uh, as we've seen, was this absolute linking at compile or link time, which means addresses were fixed. And this implied, as we've seen, that the program can only execute correctly at this given certain location in memory, uh, which was assumed at link time. What we can also do is we can do static linking at load time. So not when a program is compiled, but when we start a program in our operating system. This means uh, that the operating system has to take care of uh, adapting the absolute addresses in our program. So it needs to have a list of all the absolute addresses and then it needs to change them according to the new memory location of our program. So it has to shift them around. And we call this process, process relocation here. So this relocation information usually is then provided by the compiler, assembler, or uh, uh, incorporation with a linker. And finally, we can also do dynamic linking at execution time. So uh, this is different from load time. So when we do static linking at load time, it means the addresses don't change at runtime anymore. When we do dynamic linking at execution time, uh, we have something like an indirection. So instead of an address we're jumping to, we have a pointer to an address and we can change the contents of the value this pointer points to. So code accesses operands and branch targets only indirectly, which means we would maybe double the amount of memory accesses we require to access a global variable or to jump to a function. Uh, the program uh, in turn can be relocated in memory at any time. So even while it is running, that's an advantage compared to static linking. But a disadvantage is the resulting programs are a bit larger because you have to add all these code for uh, yeah, using these indirections we've introduced. And of course, it's also slower because you have to go through multiple levels of memory accesses to actually finally achieve your target address. So let's take a look at how this can work in a simple example. So first we'll take a look at the translation process from C code to an object file, which we also call a linker module here. And we have this very simple C program that doesn't do a lot. So it's a main program, which just calls the exit libc function and passes a parameter of zero. Now this is translated by the compiler to assembler code. This is x86 assembler. And you see the relevant instruction here that actually requires an absolute address is this call instruction here, which ultimately calls our libc function exit. And this libc function exit is somewhere in memory, depending on the current memory condition and whatever the operating system has decided. All the other instructions have register parameters or immediate parameters here. So they operate on the stack or only on registers, which means that they don't have uh, any access to absolute addresses, so we don't need to change them. So when we actually assemble this intermediate assembler source file to generate our object file, we get something like this. So here on the left hand side, we have the relative addresses relative to the start of main. And on the right hand side, we have the hexadecimal codes representing the different machine instructions of the x86 CPU. So you see x86 is a bit strange because it's an, an ancient CISC CPU. So it uses variable length instruction encoding. So for example, this push L instruction is only one byte long, whereas the move L instruction here takes two bytes. And the call instruction here, since it's a 32-bit machine, needs a 32-bit target address. So these are our hex digits here in red and an opcode E8, which says it's a call to an absolute address. Now, as we don't know at compile time where this call exit to a function in a different module should actually jump to, we add, well, uh, a target address of zero here simply. So we have four bytes of zero, which we add here. And of course, this has to be changed before we can actually build a working program here. And we need to give an additional information. So we first give the information that main starts at address zero here. Uh, 
and we give the information that at offset 6 in main here, we have a 32-bit address here, so our red digits here, which should be replaced by whatever the address of exit is when our program is linked. So the next steps in building and running our program is to link our program to an executable program. We also call this a loader module here. And uh, the linker, so our uh, final part of our yeah, program transformation or program compilation tool chain, uh, then takes this relocation information, it links the libc, which uh, among other functions contains the exit function, and then it replaces the exit function here, so this absolute address we have in our code, with the address of our exit function in our libc function. Now this is little endian byte order, so we have to read it from back to front, the single byte, so this would be address hexadecimal 148. And uh, essentially, uh, since now uh, we've linked additional code, our main function no longer starts at address 0, but for example at address hexadecimal 30. So uh, this means we also uh, add information that there needs to be a relocation done at address 36 now. That is what previously was at address 6 when we only considered relative addresses. And when this pro uh, program is finally started, so the operating system loads and executes the program, then we have a process. So for a process, we need to consider the memory contents. So this information provided by our executable program that there's still a relocation to be done at address hexadecimal 36. It's a 32-bit address in our text segment. This relocation is then performed by the operating system, so it contains uh, yeah, code to actually change this again, because now maybe we've loaded this address here at some address, uh, this process at some address hexadecimal 2, 1, something. And so now we need to change our memory contents at address 2, 1, 3, 6 hexadecimal to wherever our uh, libc exit function is now in memory. So now our address is absolute. The text segment starts at address hexadecimal 2,100. So all of the addresses here have moved down by 2,100 bytes hexadecimal. So essentially, we have to adapt this address finally before we can start our program. So this is done at load time, so part of the XX system call, uh, and the operating system tries to yeah, relocate all this information here, and if it doesn't succeed, it complains, and if it succeeds, uh, well, it can start the program. And you've seen the typical Unix component uh, responsible for doing this is LDSO, so the dynamic linker of the operating system. So we've seen that uh, relocation information is contained in the linker module and object file. This allows the linker linking of different modules linked to same addresses. So each module assumes maybe it starts at address 0. And then these are shifted around in order not to conflict with each other by the static linking process. So this allows the linking of modules into arbitrary programs without any conflicts. And it additionally generates uh, more relocation information in the loader module, so our executable file. And this enables our operating system to load the program at arbitrary locations. And before it can start the program, so after it copied the contents of the various section into memory, it has to modify all the absolute addresses based on this relocation information in the executable file. And these absolute addresses are dependent on which address the executable was actually loaded to, so these absolute addresses can only be generated by the OS at load time because the OS decides on demand which address range to allocate to our executable when it's started. Uh, we can also have dynamic linking with compiler support. Uh, this is a different approach to do this, so this would imply that the program does not use absolute addresses at all. So in programming, uh, instead of absolute addresses, you can also use so-called relative addresses. And relative addresses are always relative to the point in code where you're currently executing, so to where your uh, current program counter points. And this means instead of jumping to an address, for example, 2136, you would jump to an address current PC plus 523 or something like this. And of course, since these differences never change because your program is your program text is in one block, uh, you can get away 
on some processor architectures with using only relative addresses. Now for some processor architectures, unfortunately, relative addresses do not cover the whole 32-bit range because the offsets for relative addressing are smaller. So this means you would be unable to access the complete memory range, like the complete 4 gigabyte virtual memory address space your program would be able to use. Uh, there are solutions to solve this, uh, so if you're interested in this, you can look up a term which is called a trampoline or trampoline area, where you jump somewhere in between and then jump from that location again in order to achieve larger jump distances here. Now this generates position independent code. You can actually generate position independent code, for example, using GCC for many architectures using a flag uh, dash FPIC, so dash flag position independent code. And uh, this works with the restriction uh, that it's, uh, uh, well, maybe isn't able to cover the whole address range. So for smaller programs, you shouldn't be able to care. But what you can also do is you can try dynamic linking with support of the memory management unit. And of course, as you've seen, that is what modern computers usually do today. So the MMU takes care of mapping addresses from a logical view. So the addresses your program generates and sees to a physical view, so the address is ultimately provided to your RAM. And since we can do a mapping here, we can just move these things around, uh, like code and data in memory. Uh, and if we move code and data around in memory, we just have to uh, change this mapping information, which is essentially a large table. So uh, for this, relocation at link time is sufficient. Uh, there's one exception called shared libraries. If you're interested in details about shared libraries, please uh, take a look at the videos for the previous lecture. So when we have some sort of hardware support for mapping addresses from a logical to a physical view, there are different approaches to get this going. And one approach that was implemented rather early in the development of computers is uh, called segmentation here. So a segment in a logical address space is just a contiguous section of memory, for example, uh, like a megabyte here. And this segment in the logical address space can now be moved somewhere else. And this can be moved by, uh, by a trick. And this trick means that whenever we have a segment here, we also indicate an offset of the segment in physical memory. So for example, if our segment would be here in physical memory, but here in logical memory, we would indicate that our segment has an offset of this hexadecimal value here. So address zero ends up at address zero x one five zeros, and this goes up to address five f's, which ends up at address one five f. So it's just the addition of an offset. And if we had to move, this memory area here, this megabyte, somewhere up here to hexadecimal four five four zeros. Uh, what we, uh, the only thing you'd have to do is we don't have to change any addresses here, but we only have to change the segment offset here to point to this new different offset, and our hardware automatically takes care of, yeah, adding this offset every time that we have an access to an absolute memory location, so a jump, or a read or write, to uh, yeah, an absolute memory address. So that makes life easier, but still this requires that all this one megabyte here, for example, of our program uh, memory section is in one part and uh, is contiguous. So how is this implemented? Now uh, the hardware provides a translation table, exactly one translation table per process. And this translation table is also somewhere in memory, so we need a register in the CPU to point to this translation table. This is the segment table base address register. And this is just an address in memory where this table is stored. And now our segment table actually contains information about segments, which are numbered 0, 1, 2, and so on. And these segments have a start address here, like that one here. And we can also define a length. So these segments are the divisions of our physical memory. So we have a segment here at this address FFE0, F000, which has a length of F4, FFF bytes. And when we have a logical address that's generated by the CPU, this logical address not only contains the address itself, but also an indicator 
which of the segments this logical address belongs to, so in this case segment 2. So when this logical address is generated, what happens is that this uh, segment number 2 is added to our start of our segment table to address our segment entry 2 here. So in segment entry 2, we find the information that this segment starts at that address here. So we add the base address of the segment to this logical address inside of our process address space and obtain the physical address here uh, that we can use to access memory. Now we've seen that each segment has a length and this length is an indicator that tells us well, how, mu uh, how large is this segment actually? So if a process tries to access an address outside of this length here, so if it would, for example, be 5A02, this would be larger than 4FFF. So uh, at every uh, access here, we also have a comparison that compares this logical address here to the length of the segment. And if the length of the segment is actually smaller, then our logical address that was requested, then this is legal, an illegal memory access or an attempt to do an illegal memory access, which is outside the size of the segment. And our protection mechanism then detects this condition, uh, finds out yes, so our segment limit is below our address here. In this case, everything's fine. But if this would be the case, then our hardware would generate a so-called trap or exception which uh, indicates an access violation. So our operating system is involved again and can do something with the process. So usually it would probably try to terminate that process, which has just tried to access memory outside of its own segment. So the hardware component responsible for translating addresses, as we've already seen, uh, also in the introduction to computer architecture is the memory management unit or MMU. And in addition to uh, just uh, yeah, adding offsets. It also protects against overstepping the segment limits. So the MMU checks all the read, write, execute permissions. Uh, when a trap is generated by the MMU, it indicates a violation. So a process has attempted to access non-permitted memory locations. And this means using segments, if we keep the segments apart from each other, so we have separate segments, so that uh, one segment, including its extent, so its length, doesn't overlap any other segment, then we can protect programs against each other and we can protect the operating system from accesses by running programs. Uh, so switching a process is easy because we only exchange the segment base and since each process has its own translation table, then the mapping of these logical addresses, which are now just an offset inside of our segment added to the segment base, this translation happens automatically. And this makes swapping easier because our process now only contains logical addresses. So when we swap our process out from one memory location and we have to swap it in into different arbitrary memory location, the only thing we have to change is this entry in the translation table that indicates the offset at where we can find the start of that new segment where we just swapped in our program. Uh, using segments, we can also enable shared segments. So for example, if we have uh, different programs which have the same program code uh, code but run on different data we could share instruction so text segments or we could also have data segments so shared memory for example to communicate data between processes but segmentation alone isn't an ideal solution so segmentation has a number of problems so uh, the biggest problem actually is fragmentation so uh, if we do frequent swapping or uh, starting and termination of processes, since all the addresses in the segment have to be in one contiguous region, we uh, have some problem that we call fragmentation here. So over time, uh, the swapping and process start and termination might, might generate small gaps, which are uh, eventually unusable because they're just too small to fit a whole program into. And this is what we call external fragmentation. Uh, we can, of course, uh, do something to uh, yeah, uh, solve this problem. And this uh, process is called compacting. So compacting means that we can move segments around, trying to close the gaps, and of course, accordingly, uh, modify our segment table. But since moving segments around here involves copying the whole segment from one place in memory to another one, this is time consuming because it would involve maybe copying 
multiple megabytes of memory around when we do this compa compaction. In addition, when we do swapping, we always have to swap the whole segment in and out. So if this is several megabytes and we need more memory space for another process, the IO operations required for swapping can run for quite a long time because yeah, we have to swap in and out this whole large memory region, which of course, uh, yeah, takes takes more time the larger this memory region is. And since not all parts of a segment are used with the same frequency, so, uh, well, maybe you have a, a loop that's the major part of your program and some other parts of your program are only used in very rare circumstances, like when you want to print a page in your program. Uh, this means that, uh, well, you're probably uh, wasting quite a bit of time and I.O. Uh, performance to realize swapping here. Nevertheless, a large number of operating systems have implemented segmentation and have used segmentation and only segmentation to implement virtual memory. And this has worked well. For example, very early Unix versions on some of the earliest Intel processes like the 8286 the 8286 has never used uh, any uh, what we see in a bit of paging, so it only provided segmentation as memory management, and uh, this works pretty well. So if you're interested in this, there's a whole PDF file of like 300 pages where Intel actually describes how to implement a Unix system when you have one of these 1984 style 8286 processes lying around. But of course, we have more modern methods now, which are more efficient. So let's take a look at how this compaction works. So essentially, this just involves moving of segments. So we copy data around in memory in order to create fewer gaps, which are larger. So a larger gap has a higher probability that actually a newly started program fits into our larger gap. This, as I've already said, is an operation that involves a large overhead, uh, which depends on the size of the segments that are moved. So if we start with an initial configuration like that one here, we have three processes, so the first one, P1, uses 400 kilobytes, then we have a gap of 300 kilobytes, so the next one uses 300 kilobytes, is at start address 700 KB, then we have another gap of 400 kilobytes, and finally we have a third process that starts at address 1400 kilobytes and uses another 400 kilobytes, and then we have 300 kilobytes of free memory in our computer. Now we could do two approaches to do compaction. The first approach would be to try to move all of our segments close to each other so that we have a contiguous region which is allocated by segments so the remaining section of our memory is free afterwards we can do this here so in order to do this we have to copy p2 around so we have to copy 300 kilobytes from here to here and afterwards we can copy 400 kilobytes from here to there which leaves us with a sum of 300 plus 400 plus another 300 so a thousand kilobytes free at the end, but we need to copy P2 and P3 over, so that means we'd need to copy 700 kilobytes of memory. Well, we could do it in a different approach. Since we have an exact 300 kilobyte gap here at the end, we could simply just move P2 to the end here, which means we'd only have to copy 300 kilobytes and we'd still have a gap of 1000 kilobyte free, but it's no longer free at the end. It's free in the middle, but where exactly this is free in physical memory, uh, you don't have to care about because you have this segment offset uh, that actually automatically relocates addresses for you. So one approach that actually tries to avoid the problems of segmentation uh, is what we call paging. So with paging, we split up our logical address space into so-called pages of identical size for example, four kilobytes, so very small pages compared to maybe large segments here. And these pages can be located at almost arbitrary positions in the physical memory address space. There's one restriction, so usually if you have a page of a certain size, it can only start at a multiple of this size. So a page of a size four kilobytes, so 4096 bytes, can only start at addresses which are multiples of 4096. Now, this solves the fragmentation problem because we now have a mapping for each of these small pages to a so-called page frame, which is a memory region of the same size in physical memory. And these mappings are independent. So for example, we can map the lowest logical uh, page here in our logical address space to that physical page up here, 
and we can map the next one here to one that's lower in physical memory, and so on. So we no longer have the requirement of keeping our text and data contiguous in physical memory, whereas by keeping the logic address space contiguous here, we create the illusion for our process that all the addresses are still contiguous as expected. So this solves our fragmentation problem, obviously, because now when another process needs more pages, well, we can allocate three pages in between and just add new mappings for this new process to its own page table. So like with swapping, each process also has its own page table. Accordingly, we no longer need compaction because we can just use the gaps in between, which simplifies memory allocation and swapping. Uh, well, because uh, on the one hand, well, it uh, simplifies swapping because you only have to swap on a page granularity, which means you don't have to swap a large process, but only a very small part of the process. And the allocation doesn't have to be concerned with moving stuff around in your physical memory. So when you uh, want to implement paging, you uh, implement an MMU that has such a page table here. So this table is uh, for each page you have in your logical address space, this table provides a translation from this logical page address into the physical page frame address. So like with the segment table, we have a base address register. So this page table is also contained in main memory. And this base address register is a register in your CPU that actually tells the CPU where this page table is in physical memory, so it can find the entries here. And now for each page that you can have, and you can see you have many more pages than segments usually, uh, there's a translation which provides the physical start address of the page. So here you see, for example, we have three axes here in the least significant bits, which means that our physical page would start at address FFE0F000, but we don't specify the least uh, significant three hexadecimal digits here because these directly are copied from our logical address. So what this means is whenever we have a logical address, we split it into pieces. And for example, here we have these uh, three least significant hex digits here, one to A, and we have the other most significant hex digits. So our whole address would be 0, 0, 0, 2, 1 to A. And what we do is, uh, well, we leave the offset inside of a page unchanged. So in this case, it would be 12 bits. In real computers, it would be like, uh, yeah, some something like four kilobytes. And uh, what happens is that this address is just copied one to one to the physical address, whereas, uh, whereas the uh, upper part, the most significant bits of our logical address, well, these are eventually then, well, moved over to the MMU. So the MMU can access the page table entry for our address two, and it returns the most significant bits here. So FFE0F, and these bits are then not added, but just copied into the most significant bits of our physical address. So we split our logical address into pieces, the offset stays the same, and the most significant bits, which are the logical page number here, are translated using the MMU page table, which has an entry of a physical base address for each logical base address that's uh, in, in our uh, table here. And then this physical address is simply copied into this physical address that's provided to our main memory. So does this solve all problems? Well, not quite. So uh, as we've seen, pages have a fixed size. So page-based addressing also creates some sort of fragmentation, but this fragmentation now is internally. Internally means that uh, we have a page size of maybe 4096 4, bytes, but some page only uses like 2000 bytes of this four kilobyte. Now we cannot allocate the remaining 2000 something bytes to something else because we always map a whole page to a whole page frame in physical memory. So very often at least the last page that's allocated is not used completely. But since it's only a fraction of four kilobyte in today's computers, that's not that significant. The problem is uh, which page size should you actually choose? So obviously if you have very small pages, you can reduce internal fragmentation because the probability that really there's a lot of memory left over unused in a page is very low. 
but you would have to provide more page translation entries in your page table, so this would increase the size of the page table. And this works vice versa. So if you have large pages, then you have larger internal fragmentation, but you need fewer entries in your page table. And very common page sizes are 512 bytes. So I actually I only know of one computer family that used this, the ancient deck vex machines, which were the machines that were the first 32-bit machines uh, running Unix at DEC. And uh, well, x86 CPUs usually had four kilobytes. You can have eight kilobytes size, or if you have one of the new uh, MacBooks with an ARM processor, you even have a 16 kilobyte page size usually. So page tables are large because you have very many of these relatively small pages, and you have to pay, uh, create a translation entry for each of the page, uh, pages in your logical address space. And you have to keep them in main memory because you need to access them relatively quickly. So uh, what you do is, uh, if you want to map an address from logical to physical address, you need uh, to provide a large number of implicit page accesses for this. Uh, and one disadvantage is that we only have one segment per context, so we only have one page table for the whole process. So we don't differentiate between text and data segments here. So this might make the, let's say, appropriate use of memory difficult to control if we have a very simple MMU. Uh, so we cannot distinguish between code accessing a text segment or a data load and store operation to a data segment because it's all just pages in our very simple model uh, here. So one idea here is to yeah get the best of both worlds. So to try to combine the paging approach we've just seen with our segmentation approach we've seen before. And as you can see, this diagram gets a bit more complicated now. So uh, we have a segment table base address register again. So we have processes that can contain several segments here. But now our logical address here no longer consists only of a segment and an offset, but it consists of a segment. And the rest of the address is split into a logical page number and an offset inside of that page as we've seen before. So the segment bit table base address register as used before start, uh, points to the start of our segment table. And if we have a logical address that we want to translate, that indicates a segment number of one. We add this segment number to our base address and we retrieve this page number here, for example. So we say, okay, now this is uh, in our page table pointer, which points to essentially this start starting address here plus our logical address. So this is uh, would be uh, very similar to our simple paging here. So we would finally retrieve this entry here. And what we also have to do now is to compare if yeah, this number of pages here that are part of the segment. So this segment here uh, has five pages here. So if the page number we're trying to access inside of that segment here, yeah, is actually, yeah, smaller or equal to the limit that we have here. So we actually combine the checking of limits and overstepping of limits from segmentation. And we no longer map a whole logical address by just adding stuff, but we add this page table here as an additional indirection, which then, as we've seen with page tables, then finally gives us the upper bits of the address, whereas the lower bits of our physical address are just copied over from the logical address. And when we figure out that for this given segment here, we are trying to access a page that's outside of the limits here, so this comparison would actually result in a yes, we again obtain a trap to indicate an access violation, so the operating system can do something about this. Now, uh, enable to, uh, in order to enable a segmentation plus page addressing, you've seen we need to access the segment table and we need to access our page table for the segment here and the process. And finally, we need to access the memory location we originally intended to access. So this requires even more implicit memory accesses. Uh, this also implies that we have large tables in memory. So now we have the segment tables plus all the page tables here. It's a mix up of different concepts and uh, still we might uh, want to swap complete segments here. So uh, we could do something else. We could do multi-level page addressing to, uh, uh, that we combine with paging. So when we have pages, uh, as I've already mentioned, swapping complete segments is no longer necessary. 
uh, because uh, using a bit of additional hardware we can enable our system now to swap single pages uh, that is what we call paging uh, to, to distinguish it from swapping from and to disk so now we need a bit more of hardware support to do this so in addition to indicating a physical address for a logical page, uh, page number we have an additional bit which we call the presence bit here and this presence bit actually indicates if this physical page or if a physical page that uh, this logical page mapped to is actually uh, currently uh, contained in main memory or if not if it's swapped out to disk so if the presence bit is set here then nothing changes because it's an indication okay we have this physical address it's a valid one uh, so we have the data already in memory nothing has changed if this presence bit is a zero so it's cleared then our hardware again generates a trap because we can't access this information directly because it's currently not in physical memory so this trap is what we call a page fault and this page fault again calls an operating system function and this operating system function then tries to locate this page on the disk page it in to main memory and then finally it adds a new entry here for this logical page number two into our page table with this start address where it has just loaded the contents of this page from disk sets the presence bit to one and then our process that was interrupted by our trap our page fault can continue so that's the task of a trap handler and as you can see this can get quite complex already and of course you see we have uh, to have hardware support in the cpu enabled to generate these uh, traps whenever a page is not present in main memory so what we can do now is uh, we can use a two level uh, page based addressing here so essentially we have a segment here in our logical address like segment three and then uh, we have two different parts of the most significant bits of our logical address here and finally the offset as we've seen before and so this would just uh, access a certain segment table first because it's segment three but then we don't have one large page table for the whole segment but we have page tables in a hierarchy so for example these uh, eight bits indicating an entry of two would indicate that we have to search here then we have an entry of three and finally we arrive at the page table entry we want to uh, just finally uh, see because this contains a physical address we take the physical address as before add the offset to the end and this helps uh, now in such a multi-level page addressing scheme we would also want to have a presence bit for all entries on the higher level so not only for the final resulting page table entry uh, because this enables us to swap out page tables so these page tables may use quite a lot of memory and may be rarely used for example if this page table here would be uh, the one that contains only the pages uh, used for code that uh, is your printing functionality and you don't need it and as long as you don't need it you can now no not only uh, page out the code and maybe data of your printing functionality but also the related page table and this also means on the other hand that you can create page tables now on demand at access time so this saves memory because uh, well you can load stuff on demand so you this enables you uh, to yeah not having your program loaded completely from disk and that's what unix does actually when you start a program uh, it doesn't load anything but it just jumps to the start address of a program since there is no memory map entry for the start address uh, a page fault is generated and this first page fault actually uh, then causes the operating system to bring in the first four kilobyte for example of the program text segment without loading anything at all so that makes it a bit easier because it's all on demand uh, but of course the latencies are higher when you are jumping or accessing uh, a segment or a page that's not already in memory now the problem here is uh, you see okay we have to go through that one here to that one here and that one here so we need even more implicit memory accesses before we finally arrive at our physical memory location and as you can imagine requiring three additional main memory accesses for page tables and segment tables before you can actually read the one address you want to read or jump to that address you want to jump to has a significant overhead so a factor of three or four or something is certainly unacceptable so you need a solution to make this a bit faster.
And this solution works very similar to the solution uh, in yeah memory hierarchies we've seen already. So uh, we have uh, in computer main memory very slow main memory and a very fast CPU in comparison. So for main memory accesses, what we do is we have small fast intermediate memories we call caches, which store an excerpt of the main memory. So just part of the information of the main memory because they're much smaller than our main memory. And we can do the same with our page table entries. So what we introduce here is a so-called translation look aside buffer. And this translation look aside buffer is also just a cache, but a special cache for page table entries. So very fast cache. And this cache is consulted before we do an eventual lookup in a page table. Because if we find an entry there and it's fast, we don't have to go through all of our main memory to get the mapping information. So essentially what happens, you have your page table base address register, but now when you have a logical address here and we have omitted the segments to make it a bit easier here, uh, what is done is that there is a simultaneous lookup. So we pass this uh, page number here, this logical page number to our TLB. So a TLB is fast and the TLB has uh, comparisons for all of the addresses here at once. So uh, this is so-called associative memory. And if the TLB finds an entry that matches our upper part of our logical address here, then it immediately returns the uh, physical page frame offset here. If this is not the case, we have a TLB miss. And we, what we could have initiated at the same time is a regular page table lookup, which takes much longer, but then ultimately also provides our physical address here. And whenever we do such an uh, update here, such a lookup here, we update the TLB to contain this new mapping for our next access. Maybe we uh, want to do it through the same uh, for, uh, logical page. So uh, what we have using a TLB is fast access to this page address mapping and the information is contained in the TLB. And as we've seen, this is fully associative, which means for each of the TLB entries, we have a separate comparator. So we can figure out in one step instead of going through the whole list, which would take far too long. Uh, so we have to find the information in one step. If we have a match in the TLB, and if there's no match, we still have to do a page table lookup here. So if we have a page in the TLB, so mapping entry, uh, we don't need to implicitly access any main memory pages. Uh, now this TLB caches entries. So we've seen each process has its own page table. So accordingly, when we switch between processes, then we also have to invalidate the TLB entry. So we call this flushing the TLB. This is similar to flushing a cache when we switch processes. So this can be quite expensive here. And if we try to access a page that's not contained in the TLB because the TLB is relatively small, then in addition to looking it up in our page table in main memory, this information is then also copied to, into the TLB. Since our TLB has only very few entries here, we need to eventually kick out an old entry in the TLB. So we need to select an old entry of the TLB that has to be replaced by the new one. So when we subsequently try to access this old page for the old TLB entry, that information has to be well uh, loaded from our page table again. So since the hardware overhead is relatively large, our TLB sizes are relatively small. So for example, for a core <coughs> so for a Intel Core i7 CPU, for example, you have a TLB with 512 mapping entries for a page size of 4 kilobyte. An Ultra Spark T2 CPU has separate TLBs for data and instructions. So the data TLB has 128 entries. The code TLB is smaller and only has 64 entries, but the page sizes are twice as big as the Core i7. And you cannot obtain much larger TLBs currently because of timing. So it takes a lot of time to uh, yeah, do this associative memory uh, well uh, in, in a efficient hardware implementation. And of course, cost considerations, because the more entries you have in your TLB, like 512 means you need lots of chip area because you have like 512 comparators running at the same time. This also takes a lot of energy because eventually you have one or zero hits out of this. So you waste the other comparators here in order to make your TLB fast. So of course, people have tried to solve uh, problems uh, related to MMUs for quite some time. Uh, 
And one idea that was invented uh, relatively late in the development of page tables is to actually flip the information in the page table around. So uh, what was done is to invert this page table. Inverted page tables means that we actually not store a physical address for a logical address, but for each physical page frame in memory, we store a related logical address now. And since these physical frame page frames now can belong to different processes, we also have to enter information into our page table, which process this mapping belongs to in order not to map logical addresses for the incorrect process to a process's address space. So this works just the other way around. So for a logical address here, uh, we take the upper bits and then we check, is there actually an entry for this here in our page table that's inverted? And uh, if that's the case, then we know the physical address here, but this inverted page table can now be smaller because we only need to have an entry in this inverted page table for all of our physical page frames which are in use currently in main memory instead of the maybe many many more logical pages of all the processes that are running at the moment. So uh, this works pretty well for large logical address spaces which would have very large uh, page tables also um, because uh, yeah either you have these large page tables or you increase the number of your address translation levels even more which would make a page fault more costly and since page tables are often only sparsely populated so you have very many empty entries this gives you a compact representation uh, this inverted page table uh, which keeps the page tables small so they require comparatively uh, little memory to store all the address mappings because you only have to store address mappings for physical page frames and it can also mean that the table can always be kept in main memory uh, but uh, it has a number of disadvantages first if you want to share page frames between separate processes this is difficult to implement you've seen that there's always a process number indicated in this uh, physical inverted page frame table um, if you have process local data structures uh, that um, th these are used for pages that are swapped out and uh, lookups in the page table can also have a large overhead so here you again have to use something like associative memories or hash functions to enable a better performance now despite these disadvantages many early 64-bit processes have used this approach for address translation so Sun Ultra Spark, IBM PowerPC, Intel Itanium, and some versions of the DEC Alpha. But uh, if you know a bit about processor architectures, you will find out that it's very difficult to find any machine with one of these processes nowadays on the market. So maybe uh, regular page tables have one out here. Though looking at inverted page tables is interesting because it's, it's a different approach for the sake of efficiency. So what have we learn today. We know that the operating system has to work in close cooperation with the hardware, so the MMU for example, to enable efficient memory management. And to do this the MMU provides segmentation and or page-based addressing, so either one of those or a combination of both. And uh, this implicit indirection of memory addresses now allows us to move either complete segments or pages of uh, code and data of a running process around. And this has to be controlled by the operating system. So memory management is a large and complex part of implementing an operating system kernel. And in addition, we see uh, that we have to take a, a strategic decisions for the placement strategy, for example, where to put stuff with the first fit or best fit or body approach, for example. These differ with regard to fragmentation and the required overhead uh, for allocation and release. And selecting the appropriate strategy is not a one and only decision, but this really depends on the expected profile of your applications. So for example, which pieces of the code are often used, which da data access patterns do you have, and so on. And when you swap segments or you page pages, you need a loading strategy and also a replacement strategy and we'll talk more about replacement strategies in the next lecture. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening, and until next time.